Hi, I'm Matt Culkin, co-chair of Steptoe's Financial Services Group, and welcome to Financial Services University. We're pleased to present a short series of scripted conversations with colleagues from across the firm's practice groups and our offices around the world. Today, we're gonna to talk trade policy, and there's nobody better to talk with than my colleague, Jeff Weiss, who co-chairs Steptoe's International Trade Policy Practice and also leads the firm's supply chain team. And we're gonna get into that too. So Jeff, thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me, Matt. Looking forward to it. So let, let's jump right in. Can you tell us all a little bit about your background and experience in trade policy? Sure, uh, so I actually spent more than 15 years uh, in the US government um, earlier in my career. Uh, I serve as a trade lawyer and trade negotiator at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative in both uh, Washington, D.C. and Geneva, which is where the WTO is headquartered. Worked a lot on uh, trade and regulatory issues. Um, I also served as the political deputy at the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, uh, which is the part of OMB that oversees U.S. regulatory policy. And I was the deputy policy director for the Secretary of Commerce, um, both in the in the last administration. And I worked on a lot of other policy issues uh, when I was in government, including U.S. standards policy and cybersecurity standards policy. I was the lead U.S. negotiator on digital economy issues at the G20, uh, supply chain, um, and I really was able to supplement my trade experience with a broader set of of policy areas that I think help me better understand how the government works and how to address complex issues that may require the use of tools for multiple policy areas. So, so let's talk about trade policy in the financial services arena. So if a company has a concern about foreign regulatory barriers to, to trade, to investment, how does a company go about raising that with the government? Well, the first thing to remember is that each case is going to be different. Um, it could be a proposed uh, bill, a uh, proposed rulemaking, a policy change that you might have a concern about, um, you know, changes in political leadership, changes in personnel within an agency. Um, that obviously can matter. Um, you have to come up with a strategy. Um, generally speaking, um, you'd need to develop um, a short white paper explaining what the issue is, the importance, potentially the urgency, uh, as well as what specific remedy you seek. Um, and you might need to bring uh, text with you or a legal analysis. And then you need to meet with the relevant administration officials and Hill staff, and that's gonna depend on the issue. And when it comes to trade and financial services issues specifically, you know, USTR runs a formal interagency process to formulate US government trade positions. There is a trade and financial services subcommittee. Um, most of the issues uh, are gonna be resolved at the staff level, but sometimes they can be elevated to political levels where there's an interagency disagreement um, about whether to raise an issue with a foreign government, how to raise an issue with a foreign government. Maybe it's something commercially important, but raises systemic issues for the regulator and they're not sure uh, if, you, if they want you to raise it or not. Um, there could also be a relationship issue where, uh, for example, the State Department or the White House has to weigh in on the issue because there are a variety of issues being raised with that government and the government has to decide, you know, how this can be raised and where it can be raised. Um, as you can imagine, USTR and Treasury are typically going to be leading on trade and financial services issues, uh, but commerce and state can also be important depending on the issue and the forum. In my experience, it can also be helpful to meet with uh, White House offices like NSC or NEC. Um, for the Hill piece, it's usually important to meet not just with the relevant committee staff uh, for trade, it's finance and ways and means, um, but also um, you know, for financial services, Senate banking and House financial services committees. Um, and it always helps to meet with staff from interested members, uh, especially if they sit on one of those committees or another relevant committee like appropriations. Uh, for each case, you're gonna to need to formulate a different strategy since you may be working with different sets of actors, both internally and externally. And I think the external part is important as well because you'll probably need to build a coalition and manage 
uh, folks who may be opposed to your position. That's got to be part of your strategy. Uh, and so you really need a cross-cutting team of experts uh, on trade, financial services, and government affairs who regularly do work in the relevant jurisdiction, uh, potentially before relevant intergovernmental bodies, and know the people and the processes to be able to put together and execute an effective strategy. Um, and there are actually a good amount, for better or worse, uh, of trade and financial services market access issues that are out there right now. If you go to the USTR website and you look at the National Trade Estimate for 2020, USTR right now is tracking about um, uh, financial services market access issues with about two dozen different countries and trying to resolve them. So that, that's, quite a, that's quite a few. Um, and by the way, we've been talking about influencing the U.S. government to raise issues with other countries, but you can also raise trade concerns with the U.S. government about things the U.S. government is planning to do, uh, whether it's a proposed law or, or regulation, um, if it's a Treasury reg and it's being reviewed by OMB because it's economically significant, you may need to meet with them. Um, so the same process works in reverse. So, so let's let's talk about market access uh, and it sounds very much like it's an art and not a science in terms of who you involve and how you involve them and marshalling the facts and the relationships mm -hmm. can you use a specific example i know you've worked on these issues in the past yeah well i think a, a good one involves the the recent phase one deal between um china and the united states um in that negotiation uh, I worked on behalf of a client to insert language into the phase one deal to liberalize regulatory requirements for custody banks in China. The issue was that a lot of custody banks were having market access issues in China due to unnecessarily onerous in-country capital requirements for branches of custody banks uh, in order to operate in China. So we came up with a strategy. We built a coalition of custody banks we met with USTR and Treasury, who are co-leading the talks with China. We met with relevant congressional staff, we explained the issue, and we provided suggestions for how to solve the problem in the agreement. Phase one agreement came, comes out, and it actually contained a provision addressing our concern. It allowed branches of U.S. financial institutions to provide securities investment fund custody services, and the parent company's overseas assets would be taken into account by the regulator in order to fulfill the applicable asset requirements. And China also committed to review and approve qualified applications um, by U.S. financial institutions to provide these services um, on an expedited basis. So fast forward to July of this year, July 2020, and the China Securities Regulatory Commission, the CSRC, issued joint regulations with the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission. Um, these were the revised administrative measures for custody services for securities investment funds, and, and they implemented uh, the provisions in the phase one deal. And as a result of that, uh, Standard Charter has received an approval from CSRC to provide securities investment fund custody services in China. Citibank Bank received an approval, and HSBC and Deutsche Bank have submitted applications. Um, so that's a success story. Uh, that's, a, that's a great example. Thanks for sharing that. I'm, I'm curious if we can kind of flip that, um, you know, particularly here in Washington, there's a number of, of companies and trade associations with staff here, and they're constantly monitoring developments around the world. You know, how do you, how do you take that same approach and operationalize it when you're talking about sort of a general regulatory trend or global regulatory developments in the financial services space, can you can you work on sort of a broad-based initiative as well? Absolutely, it's the same process. And um, in fact, it's always better to meet with the key decision makers in the administration uh, and in Congress before you have a specific market access issue, a specific regulatory issue, so that you can get to know them and what they care about and they get to know your issues. That way, when something breaks, they're already familiar with it, and it's much easier for them to get clearance to intervene or to take a position. Um, you're also going to learn from those conversations who might be opposed to your position, and any nuances, you know, legal nuances, political nuances, or others 
that you may have to reflect in your advocacy uh, when the time comes. These are also opportunities to try to shape global trends before they cause real problems for your company or to create opportunities. Um, and it could be through legislation, through trade agreement tax, as we just discussed. Maybe there's an opportunity in a regulatory cooperation forum. Maybe there's a work stream um, relating to financial services in an intergovernmental organization, or you could create one, um, or, or other means. Um, so basically, it's the same thing. You put together an idea, you create a coalition and a strategy, um, and you execute it. Um, one example, right now I'm writing public reports for two global trade associations. In one case, we're trying to influence how uh, a, a industry sector is regulated globally. The other report we're using to try to promote the use of uh, services from that sector when it's appropriate. Um, and one area we're focusing on is in the mobile payment space. Hmm. So I'm going to I'm going to take you now and switch gears. So our firm has just launched a supply chain team and a supply chain initiative, and you're leading the effort. Can you tell us a little bit about that work and specifically, you know, where the issues pop up for financial services companies? Sure. So this is an initiative, um, the supply chain team that we launched earlier this month. Um, Needless to say, there's been a lot of supply chain disruption caused by COVID and government policies in response to COVID. Uh, we've seen other things disrupt supply chains, uh, U.S.-China trade tensions. We've seen increasingly stringent export control laws. We've seen U.S. executive actions to bolster the U.S. telecommunications supply chain and the bulk power system in the energy space. And then, of course, there's Brexit. Um, and there's more disruption coming. So, for example, the European Union is going to propose a carbon border adjustment mechanism that could impact the costs of goods and where they're made and how they're transported. And as I mentioned before, I was the supply chain lead for the Commerce Secretary in the last administration. So we were looking at a lot of these supply chain issues, but it was a very different time. The, the policy challenges then, um, we assumed relatively stable supply chains. But now, of course, those supply chains are being disrupted and with all that disruption, potentially all businesses could be impacted, including with respect to the sourcing of goods or parts or accessories or services, the cost of those products, sales, accounts receivable. Um, and this could impact lenders, borrowers, and investors. It could impact disclosures that have to be made by public companies. Uh, it may lead to shareholder litigation about material information. Boards of directors may have to make decisions in line with their duties to corporations. It can impact not just stock prices, but derivatives markets as well. Um, and it could affect borrowers' ability to access loans where they'd normally pledge inventory or accounts receivable as collateral. Um, so we've been seeing clients come to us with more and more supply chain issues. Um, so for example, how do we keep a critical material in the country to maintain the current supply chain in a, in a sector where it's stable? Um, how to incentivize development of a downstream supply chain in the U.S. where that's being uh, disrupted. Uh, how to influence a policy change that could disrupt a supply chain that's stable at the moment. So what we found is all these issues implicate different areas of law and policy and all of them are cross-jurisdictional. So we decided to sort of formalize what we've been doing and put together cross-practice, cross-jurisdictional supply chain team across the firm to help clients solve these problems. So whether the issue involves customs, labor and employment law, tax, trade, transportation, government contracts, or even if it involves monitoring developments for potential impacts on financial services or intervening to shape policy responses, we can put a team together to develop and execute a strategy. And, and what's really interesting about that, Jeff, is, is you're not just addressing the immediate direct issues coming out of supply chain disruption, but it's really everything that flows from the disruption. Exactly. Well, before I let you go, I just I want to offer you the chance to sort of reiterate any key takeaways. We've covered a number of different issues, so I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to take us out. Well, again, thanks, you know, thanks for inviting me on. Um, Check out our supply chain website. 
Uh, I think that's really useful. We're going to be posting a lot of content there. Um, and again, take a look at the, the national trade estimate and look at the kinds of issues, market access issues that USTR tends to raise. Um, and we can talk through how we might be able to engage on some of those issues um, and try to get results like we did with the China phase one deal. So again, uh, thanks for inviting me. No, thanks for coming. And thanks uh, for joining and look forward to doing this again. Uh, this does it for another episode of Steptoe Financial Services University. Please make sure to check out the list of course offerings on our Financial Services University website. And for more information about our financial services practice, of course, please visit steptoe.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.